Yes, it is an, indeed a wonderful passage from God's Word, and I was just enjoying it as, as you read it to us. Um, this morning, uh, we're continuing. This is our eighth study in the Acts of the Apostles. And uh, as usual, I've printed a, a leaflet, which you'll be able to download from the church website at some stage. Uh, I'll get the thumbs up. I think it might be there already. That's correct. And... Uh, and inside the leaflet, there, there are some notes of the sermon. Now, this is not to encourage you to go to sleep while I'm talking, uh, but just to uh, jog your memory later when uh, you perhaps want to think again about some of the points that come to the surface as, as we read this. And, and uh, I've used this image. Uh, it's a, an image by uh, an artist whom I've never heard of, Francesco uh, Trevisiani, Trevisiani. Uh, painted in 1709. It, it looks to me like it's a fresco on the plaster of wall somewhere, and it's of the Apostle Peter baptizing uh, Cornelius, the Roman centurion. And I've put that on the cover of the leaflet uh, for this week. And our, our theme then is the conversion of Cornelius. How did this Roman centurion uh, become a believer in Jesus Christ, and what are we told about it? There are four things I want to draw your attention to. I've been challenged over the break uh, that I've had. One of in the first week, I was challenged by an article reading uh, which suggested um, we should consider a one-point sermon. And uh, you, if you've watched any of our other videos, you'll know that I, I like to try and gather my thoughts around several locals, loci. And the first one today is Cornelius's need for conversion. I want to think about that. Then I want to think about Peter's racist attitude. And then I want to think about the Savior who was cursed. And then finally, the idea of a Gentile Pentecost. So there are four ideas and uh, I'm going to suggest that there is one overarching idea, but you'll have to bear with me to the end to understand what that might be. So let's take these points one at a time. Firstly, um, the uh, Cornelius's need for conversion. Well, Cornelius was a good man, we're told that. And that he, as we read the text, we, we find that he has a very appealing character. Uh, we like what we hear about this man. Uh, so what is it that we're hearing? Well, we told that he was a military officer, a centurion, and he was with the Italian cohort. Uh, I've, I've uh, used this image, as I said, and you'll notice that he's wearing his, some military hardware in this image. I don't think for a moment that when he welcomed Peter, he was dressed in his battle gear. But it's a reminder to us that he was a military man. And uh, the, the, the text that I put with it was uh, this uh, in red here, uh, in the red box. And it says some Latin at the bottom. I hope you can read it. It's uh, cohors tu italica civum romanorum. And these are the words that uh, the Jewish historian Josephus uses to describe this military cohort that was stationed at Caesarea. So that not only does Acts tell us that he was of the Italian cohort at Caesarea, which was where the Roman administration was centered in Judea, uh, the city that was named after Caesar in his honor, built by Herod the Great, and so that, this is where the Roman base was headquartered. And uh, Cornelius is uh, a centurion, which means he's in charge of 100 men. He's a military captain. The uh, Roman army was divided into uh, cohorts. A cohort was 600 men. And there were six centurions in a cohort. And there were 10 cohorts in a legion. So a legion consisted of 6,000 soldiers. So here's a man in charge of a hundred men, and he's become a God-fearing man. That is, the Roman pantheon of gods is no longer so attractive to him. He's 
supportive of the Jewish synagogue at Caesarea. And he's devoted to Israel's God. Somehow, the one unseen eternal God of Israel is making more sense to him than the various gods of his uh, own background or as a Roman man uh, or the nations they conquered who were added to the Roman pantheon as, as uh, Rome took them over, gave them other names sometimes. So here he is, and he's a, a military man, and he's, we're told that uh, he becomes a believer. How does this come about? What is going on here? And what do we uh, have to say about this particular man today? Well, so stationed in Caesarea, he, he's uh, been generous to the poor. He's a good man, we heard. So his, what, does, why does, what more does he need? What does a good man need? A good man who's inclined to believe in the one true God. Well, we know that Jesus said in Matthew's Gospel that everybody needs to be converted. He said, unless you be converted and become like little children, you'll miss the kingdom. So here is Cornelius, a good man, a praying man, a man who believes in Israel's God. But there's something missing. All of this needs to have a deeper root in his life. He needed to come into God's family. He needed to know God as his Savior and Lord. And God's message, the good news, uh, the Bible's message, the gospel as we call it, the good news has the power to convert people, men and women, boys and girls, and bring them into God's family. That's why Luke is telling us the story about how that message is radiating out from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria, and it's going to go on to the ends of the earth, as I hope we'll see uh, in our ongoing series of studies. But the initiative lies with God. How does it lie with God? Well, you saw Christine extended the passage I wanted read by just taking us a little bit back because the back story is important. Peter had to be dealt with, not only Cornelius. There was stuff in Peter's life that needed to be changed. Now, Peter was already in the family of God. He was a believer in Jesus. He told them that he loved him. Lord, you know I love you. He told the risen Lord that he loved him. But there were things in his life that needed to be changed. What was it? Well, he had a racist attitude. It was resident in him. And, and so, as we, we heard about the story, uh, Peter, Peter, when he arrived, uh, he made this amazing journey. Uh, if you Google the, the trip from uh, Joppa to Caesarea, you'll find that on Google Maps, it's a journey of 11 hours, nearly 12 hours walking. Uh, the inland route takes you over a, a particular walk in, uh, in Israel, so it gets you away from the coastal strip, uh, although it uh, gives you an up and down climb a bit more. It does advise that you may need to wear a mask, so if any of you are in the short term planning to try and uh, emulate this walk, uh, you may need to wear a mask for part of the journey. Uh, in fact, uh, if you do it by car, it only takes 45 minutes. So uh, perhaps more people would do it that way today. But, but this vision that Peter had was enough to convince him that he and his companions, and it seems there were six of them, so it was a, a, a group of about 10 that traveled uh, this 10-hour trip to get to Caesarea, to uh, the home of Cornelius. So I just want to uh, blank that out for a minute. The vision that Peter had had shown him the, uh, the animals that were not uh, clean in Jewish uh, dietary laws. You'll find them in uh, Leviticus chapter 17. They weren't allowed, as we famously know, to eat pork. They weren't allowed to eat shellfish. They weren't allowed to eat fish that didn't have scales. There was a whole list of things. So it was against their religion. Jews are not allowed. This was extended. They weren't even allowed. They, the uh, restrictions that the, uh, 
the uh, people had worked out from all of this were that you couldn't even go into the home of a person who wasn't a Jew. It's against our religion. It's against Jewish law. That was how they had expanded it. So, so here is Peter, and he's got this racist attitude, and he has to overcome it. And he's given a specific vision, not just once, not twice, but three times. And the message comes home to him that he's not to call anyone unclean. He's not to call any person unclean. Hadn't Jesus taught that it's what goes into a person that makes them unclean? Not, sorry, it's not what goes in, but it's what comes out that reveals the uncleanness for which we need forgiveness. So Peter was surprised at this. When he comes to Cornelius' house, he's a little bit astonished to be, to be there. Uh, in the message version, he says, Jews just don't do this. We don't actually go into the homes of Gentile people. They didn't interact. They, and Peter had kept separate all his life. He'd been brought up in a Jewish community. He'd been a Jewish fisherman. He'd been a, a follower of a Jewish a Jesus, whom he came to believe to be the Messiah and the rightful king of the world, ultimately. The kingdom belonged to Jesus. He didn't know how he was going to take over the world, but he believed that God's Spirit would do this. And with the others, he had heard the command to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And here they are, a small group of Jewish disciples moving out, especially as persecution against them from their fellow Jews in Jerusalem increases, moving out into the world. And here is Peter, and he's being changed by the Holy Spirit as he's open to God's leading. The old name for this process of being changed by God's Spirit is sanctification. God working in our lives to change us more and more, to mold us into the image of his Son. Paul talks about this in uh, uh, Romans uh, chapter 12. I'm sure uh, many of you will remember the words. Um, just let me. Don't trust myself to have them at the top of my head. Because of God's great mercy, I appeal to you offer yourselves as a living sacrifice to God, uh, dedicated to His service and pleasing to Him. This is the divine worship that you should offer. Do not conform yourselves to the standards of this world, but let God transform you inwardly. Let God transform you inwardly by a complete change of your mind. God is changing our minds about so many things that we need to be uh, conformed to the image of Christ in. So as we move from, from uh, Peter's astonishment at the change that's happened in himself, He's arrived in the home of Cornelius. And Cornelius falls down and is so thrilled and amazed that, that these events have happened, that here is the man who it was spoken of in his vision, and he's come. He's made this journey. He's come with the uh, emissaries that he sent to bring him. And, and he falls down, and Peter says, No, don't you know, stand up. We're men together. Uh, God is the only one we should worship. And so uh, Cornelius is, uh, welcomes him in and says, tell us what God has laid on your heart to uh, share with us. And so Peter tells Cornelius and his family and his friends, because we're told they're all there, uh, about Jesus. He explicitly mentions the message he'd been given to share about his life, and his death and his resurrection. These are the core events. Now I noticed in my translation, which Christine read, it, it talks not just about his life but his death on the cross. If, if uh, I had given you a different translation, it might have read something different because the word that's used is that he died on a tree. And that's a strange word to include. So. Uh, the Good News Bible translates it to make it intelligible for modern readers that he died on a cross. 
But the actual word in the text is tree. And the question is, why is it referring to a tree? Well, in the Old Testament, in the Jewish uh, Torah, Deuteronomy chapter 22, sorry, chapter 21, verses 22 and 23. So just remember 21, 22, 23. Uh, it tells us there that anyone who dies in this horrible way is under God's curse. And this is not something that was forgotten and just buried there. Later on in writing his letter to the Christian church that was to emerge in Galatia, the Apostle Paul says uh, what this means. Chapter 3, verse 13 of Galatians. He, he says that, that Christ died on the, on the tree because he carried the curse for us. He was there not because he was uh, cursed for himself, but he was cursed after the life he lived. He, was, he died this horrible death for us. He was under God's curse. He was an object of, the word that occurs to me is loathing. There was something that God loathed about Christ in that moment. What, what could that have been? It was he was bearing sin. The world's sin was laden on him. And so when Christ cried out, he said, My God, why have you forsaken me? And the answer is that in that moment, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Not just the Jewish people, not just the priests, but the world. What Jesus did on the cross has global implications, universal implications. He was in our place, and what was on him belonged to us. And everything about our lives that is offensive to God, what, what could God not like about us? Well, alas, perhaps we need to answer that for ourselves. There are many things that in which we disappoint ourselves. How easily might we disappoint God? There's an old song about always hurting the one you love. And I'm sure uh, if we're honest with ourselves, we'll, we'll see that. So our lives have messed up God's world. And we've hurt and harmed those we love. But Jesus willingly stepped into our place. And Peter is remembering that. And he's giving emphasis to that. He died on a tree. And he rose again on the third day. One of the great challenges about uh, being in quarantine was not allowed to leave the house. You get some exercise around, uh, perhaps on a, on a device as I did and as Christine did. But then what about the daytime? And I, I set myself the target of reading 74 pages of Tom Wright's book on the evidence for the resurrection of the Son of God. It's a 740-page book, and it was a great discipline, and it was marvelous. It was marvelous to be learning so much uh, from a great uh, teacher of God's Word. And so I, I uh, came to a new respect for the way the Gospels and Paul and Peter present the resurrection of Jesus. And here is Peter sharing it to a Roman soldier Somebody presumably uh, grew up with Latin, presumably had reasonably good Aramaic or Hebrew uh, because he was resident in Caesarea and sympathetic to the Jewish community there. And he's hearing in his own language uh, about the Savior who died for him, for him. And he is the judge of the living and the dead, the one by whom, he says, our sins can be forgiven. These concepts are central to the mission of the Christian church. The life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus through whom our sins can be forgiven. And the church must never lose sight of these central events. I want you to imagine how this sounds to a Roman centurion. The Savior who was cursed, the anointed one, the Jesus who became the Christ, the anointed one, the one who died on the tree. 
what need might a Roman soldier have had of forgiveness? We watched a bit of television last night, a little bit of Ernest Hemingway on SBS. And in the 1920s, he wrote a novel about a licentious group of young people having a good time in Europe. And he wrote a story about this, one of his early novels. And the commentary on it was that here were young people trying to blot out the memory of the First World War, which had ended just a few years before. In, the, in which they had been involved, blotting out the memory of the war. You know, nowadays, we still have wars in our world, and hundreds of thousands of people have seen things that nobody really ought to see. And we give soldiers the responsibility of going into war and killing people. That's the job of a military man when it comes down to the bottom of it. Even if he's flying drones over some other country far away, there is uh, death dangerously close. And so here is a Roman soldier. And because we call post-traumatic stress disorder today, doesn't mean that the reality that that represents, those four letters, PTSD, uh, doesn't mean that that didn't exist as a reality then. We know, we know that people who went to war came back damaged if they came back at all. They came back affected by the experience. And in Australian folklore, the way people relax together on Anzac Day has been so often to have a drink together and to talk to the only people who know what it was like, the ones who were there with you. It's there in our literature. It's there in our songs. It's there in our folklore. So what did this mean to Cornelius? To hear that on a cross someone had died for him. That uh, here is uh, the uh, famous image of Christ of St. John of the Cross by Salvador Dali. What did it mean? Well, it was, a, it was a breakthrough moment. It was an astonishing moment. The message was received with faith. Cornelius was ready to hear this. His family received the message. The words Peter shared were believed. And to his amazement, to Peter's amazement, the Holy Spirit just transformed that moment. And they began to speak in tongues and praise God. And I just want to comment on these two things. They spoke in tongues. I don't know many Presbyterians who speak in tongues. What does it mean? Well, in Acts, of course, it's other languages. That's what it was on the day of Pentecost. And we can only assume that Luke means the same thing here because he makes the connection. Peter makes the connection indeed. It's the Holy Spirit has fallen on them as it did on us at the beginning. And so what it's saying to us is that the worship of God, the language in which God communicates, has no special status. God doesn't uh, restrict us to Hebrew or Aramaic, or Greek, in which the New Testament documents were first written to us. Now, God is not prioritizing one language or one culture. God wants all languages and cultures to bring praise and worship. And, and Luke has told us in Acts of people who, res, who were converted and who didn't speak in tongues. Uh, one could instance, for example, the Ethiopian eunuch, and, uh, and Paul the Apostle in the previous chapter. These were converted to Christ but didn't speak in tongues. And there are others who received the Holy Spirit but didn't speak in tongues. So it's not a, it's not a mark of Christianity to speak in tongues, but it is a, a truth about the faith that God does not prioritize one language. Racial and cultural superiority have no place in the Christian religion. Not all religions think that way. Now, if you know anything about Islam, for example, you'll know Islam prioritizes Arabic. I was surprised when I discovered that you can't actually buy a copy of the Quran in another language because it's not regarded technically as the Quran. As soon as it's taken out of Arabic, it's not exactly the Quran. 
So Arabic is prioritised in Islam and other cultures have to learn it. And I discovered that there are people who can recite the Quran without knowing what it means because knowing the meaning is less important than actually articulating the words in the language of the Quran. Now Christianity is different. I remember one of my elders many years ago in the Yarra Valley uh, came and told me that he was not going to be a chemist any longer. He ran the local chemist store, store and uh, he was going to be a Bible translator. And he spent over 20 years translating the Bible into Tube Tube, a language I had never heard of. Well, what a great, well, how could he do that? Uh, five, maybe 10,000 people speak that language in Milne Bay province of Papua New Guinea. And Alan Canavan and his wife Faye went and lived there. They learned the language. They wrote it down. They gave it an alphabet. They provided readers so people could learn to read their own language, which had not been written down before. And they gave them the New Testament and the books, many of the books of the Old Testament now. Uh, because Christianity says in, God is welcome in our culture. He's welcome in your culture and mine. And no culture has priority. Not English not Spanish, not Hebrew or Greek. And the second thing we have is that their desire was to praise God. It indicates a deep, says Tim Keller, a deep psychological shift. Praise shows us what's at the core of our lives, what we regard as worthy above all things. And here was uh, Cornelius who had helped maintain the synagogue, who had been charitable towards the poor, and who had this uh, prayer to God that uh, he regularly prayed to God. And God has brought it back. to th These things are good that he was doing, but now he understands that he's in God's family, that he has been given forgiveness and reception into the family of God, and there's a new taproot to the things he does not done just because it seems to be a good thing to do, not done because of his widening interest in the culture in which he is, but because he's been taken to the heart of that culture and shown that God in his Messiah has loved us. May the love of God be the taproot of all our worship and our praise. And today, may we give... Uh, Thanks to God for his direction in our lives and may our worship, even online, as we uh, bow before him in our homes and in our hearts, might it flow from a desire to worship God above all else for the love he has shown for us and for his welcome into his family. Amen. Now, I, I've... Uh, going to lead us in a time of prayer. I invite you to uh, follow with me and to join in the Lord's Prayer as he taught it to us at the end of our, our prayer time. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that by your Holy Spirit you are committed to work in the lives of each of us today. Keep us sensitive to your word and spirit so that the ingrained behavior and bad attitudes which we may retain are remodeled to conform more and more to Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Thank you that after his life of loving service to you and to all of us, Jesus did not turn from the shame and horror of the cross. We do not know we cannot tell what pains he had to bear, but we believe it was for us he hung and suffered there. Thank you that no person is beyond your redemption, that just as you knew Cornelius, so you know us. Indeed, not a sparrow falls to the ground, but you know. We think of the past week in the news so many lives lost in floods in Germany and China, raging fires in the USA, 
famine in Tigray and no doubt innumerable other places, hospitals overloaded and health systems overrun in Zimbabwe and other countries, rioting in South Africa and a world awash with refugees as people seek safety for their families and hope for the future. We pray for all who have suffered the loss of loved ones. Please bring them comfort and your message of hope. We pray for those who do not have the resources to feed their children. O oh God, have mercy. Help us in the world's wealthy nations to embrace the cause of the poor and the afflicted. All this and COVID is still causing great loss of life around the world, but especially so in Indonesia and, and India, Brazil and Argentina, and resurgent again in the USA and other places. We pray that vaccines will become increasingly available, not just to the rich nations, but by acts of generosity to all nations. As billionaires seek pleasure trips to experience weightlessness in space, develop in the wealthy a concern for pursuing peace and justice on earth, that righteousness might flow like a river and justice like a never-ending stream. We thank you for the quiet testimony of Nicola, whom Christine shared. We ask your blessing on her and all the athletes competing with one another. We pray that there might be a new sense of fraternity for each of them as they share in the Olympic Games and that the events might be a blessing to all who watch. In our country, we ask that the state of government and federal governments will keep their eye on the goal of preventing the spread of the virus, stopping infection and saving lives until all who seek vaccination receive it. Forgive the petty squabbling and political grandstanding to which we so easily fall prey. We remember elderly, vulnerable and sick friends this morning. Bring healing and comfort to them now as we commit them to you in the silence of our hearts. Help them to cast all their care on you and to know that they are precious in your sight. Help us all, like Cornelius, to enjoy being members of your family and to give you the praise and the glory in our homes and among our friends. We ask it in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray together and to say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Friends, thank you for being with us. Uh, may God bless you in the rest of the day. And may grace, mercy and peace be yours now and always. Amen.